There we go. Uh, now we've got a screen slide up. Why don't we go ahead and just check in the chat room, make sure that uh, my screen is now showing for everybody. So again, click the all panelists and attendees. Can you guys just say, yep, I can see your screen, Dave, in the chat room. That'd be great. Excellent, thanks, Jose. Okay. All right, so um, we had a little bit of an introduction from folks, but just as a, as a, just so I can see them all on one slide so I can take a screenshot of it. I am going to go ahead and ask you guys to uh, look at the top of your screen, just sort of hover over your screen, and on the very top, you'll see the word annotate, right? And what we're going to do is on this slide, I'm going to ask you guys to go up and click annotate, that little button up there, and then you'll slide over and hit the text button, and then tell me what city you're in right now. I am in Windsor, Windsor, Ontario. Canada. So give it a shot. Go up there, click the annotate button, go over and hit the little T for text, and then go in there and let me know what city you're in. So hover over the screen, sc scroll up to the top, you should see the annotate button. Give that a shot. Anybody? Uh, I hope that's turned on. Is it not turned on? I'm looking for you guys to write on my screen. And it doesn't seem to be happening. Oh, you're putting in the chat room though, that's nice. That serves the same purpose. What we're looking for here is to give, can't see it, eh? Isn't that interesting? I thought that was turned on. You know what? We're just gonna have to live with that today. And I appreciate you guys adapting and putting that in the chat room. Because uh, one of the things we've learned from COVID is we just gotta roll, <laughs> just gotta roll along with it. All right. Wow, so many people from different parts of the world. This is super exciting to get a chance to talk to you guys today, guys. So um, while, uh, that's six minutes. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna figure out why that didn't work at the end of the process here. So I'm just gonna introduce myself. Uh, my name's Dave Cormier. Uh, I am a digital learning strategist at the University of Windsor. Um, and I have been teaching and working online for about 20 years now. Um, I have the misfortune of being the person who coined the term MOOC. I do apologize to all of you about that, but that is where, if you've heard my name, that's probably where you heard it. Um, but I've been working in online communities, online teaching, uh, research for the last 20 years or so. If you end up looking up the word rhizomatic learning, you'll see some of the stuff that I do. Uh, my sort of perspectives on the internet are that we don't, it changes the way that we actually go about teaching. There's something fundamentally different about the internet. There's something that actually changes where we are as educators, where we are as learners. And it's really, really important for us to think and understand that. And that's really been the, the, the thrust of my work for the last 20 years, one way or the other. Uh, I started out as a kindergarten teacher 20 some years ago in South Korea as a wandering educator and have moved through K-12 and higher ed uh, community college uh, I've been on administration, I've been faculty, I've done bits and pieces all over education. And I'm super, super happy to be here again. Um, the, oh, I just got to erase that. You know what, we're just going to leave that there for now. So when I was here uh, five years ago, I was in an ICERI conference. I keynoted on rhizomatic learning. And That slide right there, the Rome to Road slide, is the only one that I've kept from that presentation. I thought I would bring it in because it really speaks to me to how far we've come in education. So this is the actual trail, the actual path that Julius Caesar followed to go see Apollonius Molin, who was a great teacher of uh, oratory, of speaking, um, in 62, that should say BCE, uh, in 62 BCE. So he got on a boat traveled all the way along there and went to find the one guy who was going to be able to help him out and become a better orator. In his oratory, his speaking was amazing. It was one of the things that defined his career. But that's what it looked like to find an expert. On his way back on that trip, Caesar was actually captured by pirates. That's how dangerous it was to go find the one person who could teach you. Famously, Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle, one of the greatest sages of that whole era, right? 
finding, getting your way towards finding an education was not something that was easy. Getting the best content, getting the best teachers, getting access was a huge, huge problem, right? When you look at the formation of the first two European universities, at least the University of Paris and the University of Bologna, they were set up um, so that people could travel from hundreds of miles around to come in and get access to the books. When you look at a book at that time period, you know, um, it's 200 sheep, literally 200 sheep. That's how many sheep it took, the skins of that many sheep to make one book. Books were super expensive. They were hard to make, hard to create, and it was the only way, barring you remembering something, that you could get access to something somebody else had thought. That has been the absolute foundation of our education system is information is hard to find, expertise is hard to find, and it's expensive, right? That's where we came from. That's the place we were at. Zoom forward to 2020. I want you to imagine for a second that you're walking into, I, I, one of the other things I did that I didn't tell you about is I managed a medical school uh, for a year when I first moved to, to Windsor. Many conversation with doctors. This story came out over and over again. Imagine a doctor who's sitting in um, a hospital and you walk in and you ask a question, you talk about where you're at and that doctor pulls out a cell phone and they look at their phone and start pressing on it to try to find information about what's wrong with you. The first response that doctors say that they get for this is patients look uncomfortable and they look concerned. And in some cases, patients get angry. Why is it that you need to look at your phone in order to figure out what's wrong with me. Why don't you know? Didn't you go to medical school? And at the same time, if you ask those same patients, do you really want the doctor to be working on 30 year old information from 30 years ago whenever she was in medical school? The patient's gonna say no. That's because we have a fundamental disconnect between our idea of what learning is and how people learn and the reality of the world we're in today. The changes in medicine from 63 BC to 33 BC or from 1200 to 1230 were non-existent, right? The idea of being able to remember all the things you needed and learn them all at one time and be done um, is just not applicable to the world we're in today. That same doctor who is, let's say an emergency room doctor sitting at the door of the emergency room has a patient come in that patient used to come in going, I don't know what's wrong with me, doctor, can you please help me? Now that patient has been on the internet for a half an hour and is sure that they know what test they need, let alone what problem they have. So they come in and tell the doctor, I need to have this test. And the doctor's job is no longer just, I know I'm going to tell you, it's, oh, hold on a second here. I need to know what your actual symptoms are. I need to know your history. I need to, they need to deconstruct the learner and reconstruct, deconstruct the patient and reconstruct the patient's knowledge because that person has so much access to information and frankly, in most cases, doesn't have the tools they require to assess that information properly, right? That's the real world that we live in. That's the background of this whole conversation is that we have as a culture, not just doctors, but everybody fundamentally changed our relationship to what it is to know and what it is to, to teach, to interact with people, to, to explain them something like a doctor does, or what it is to be effective, right? Those things have just changed. So COVID-19 didn't change this, right? That's not something that happened because of COVID. What COVID has done is it allowed us to understand what's happened. It has, that's the button I want. It's allowed us to understand, sorry, I had to get rid of that Windsor there. It's allowed us to understand what has actually happened. So many of us have been forced to do so many more things online that we're opening up our understanding of, um, do we really need to fly 3000 miles to go to see, to have a meeting with somebody? Do we need, to, environmentally, do we need to do it? Personally, is it actually more effective sometimes to do stuff online? I mean, I am the last person to say that I don't wanna meet people in person, I wish, we we're all in Valencia right now, having this conversation and we're going out for a, a nice tapas after this. Like, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't meet in person. What I'm suggesting is, is the potential, the possibility has fundamentally changed. 
and our access to including people from different parts of the world has fundamentally changed. There are probably lots of people in this chat right now who maybe wouldn't have been able to make it to Valencia, who are able to join in on this conversation without the massive travel costs and uh, upset to their family life that's required to actually make it out the conference. So these possible COVID didn't create these possibilities. COVID just showed them to us. So it's it's not really about the implication of moving our course online, right? So it's not, I'm gonna take these books and make them digital. I'm gonna take these assignments and copy and paste them onto the internet. It's that the digital changes what we should be doing. Just like that doctor, it changes their job. It changes what it is to be a knowledge worker in our society. The digital is just fundamentally different. I mean, just take the simplest example. When I was uh, first a language teacher, and I was a language teacher for five or six years when I started out my career, we used to do scanning activities, right? Look through this document to find such and such. One of the things that PhD students were forced to do was go through their faculty's work and do, an, do the, the um, all the words at the end, like find all the words in the text, find every time the word rhizomatic shows up in the text and put it in the back so that you have uh, an index, right? That is just not a job anymore, right? We hit control, we hit, control, hit F, we can search through any digital document. That creates a fundamental change in how we actually approach it. And that's just the simplest example. The same as copy paste, right? We used to say, well, at least if the students write out their answers, worst case scenario, even if they are cheating, they're writing them out. Well, they're not writing them out anymore. They're copying and pasting. Them. And not only that, that, that creates two responses. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but that creates two kinds of responses. Copy and paste could be, oh, we need to make sure they can't copy and paste and we're going to ask the same questions. Or you can ask the question a different way. If copy and paste is possible, should we even ask questions that respond to it, right? So anytime, I always think anytime I write a question, if a student can copy and paste an answer in 2020, if a student can copy and paste the answer, it's not the student who has cheated, though maybe they have breached trust. It's I who have asked the wrong question. Because in 2020, it's of no value to ask questions that respond to copy and paste. So that move from information scarcity to information abundance fundamentally affects what and how we teach, how we can teach, right? So it's the information abundance that's the real piece here. It's the fact that we can affect, we can effectively go out and reach and find the information we want. We can bring it back. If you ask a student a question, what is a thing? And they're sitting at home, they're going to open up Discord, ask a question to one of their friends. They are going to do a quick Google search and find it it changes that piece. Because our schools, while we're still face-to-face, -face, while we're still thinking in a face-to-face -face environment, we have this cone of artificial scarcity that wraps around us, right? We have artificially cut off their information source. And you can say, we've cut off their ability to cheat. What I would return to you is, we've cut off, it's like saying, it's the, 20, it's the 21st century equivalent of saying, I want you to learn something, but you can't have access to the library. So you need to ask your parents. Because that doctor, whenever that doctor is working, they are going to use their phone. They are going to reach out for the extra information. They are going to want to, and it doesn't matter if it's a doctor or a mechanic or um, a person who is looking to make a choice in an election or about an environmental issue. We want them to be reaching out for information comparing different types of information and then coming back because that's what's going to happen to them. If you look at the election, which I'm sure uh, you've heard about, of our friends uh, to the south that just happened here in Canada, uh, just happened in the United States, they were bombarded with information. No one is going to be able to handle that with the education that we grew up with, right? That education was go out, find a good source, find a reasonable answer, come back with that answer. The experience that the American electorate just had was, here are a thousand, a million different ways of looking at things, choose how to vote. We fundamentally need to be moving our schools away from artificial scarcity 
to living inside that abundance. And for us here in Canada, we've been online uh, in the university sphere for certainly my school has since March 19th. And that's what we've been confronted with is now our artificial cone of scarcity isn't there anymore. What are we gonna do about it, right? And once the thing is no longer scarce, once we don't have that clutching control over the content, we don't have the power, right? I love that once a thing is no longer scarce, it can no longer be controlled. We lose that control over the content and we lose that kind of control over our classrooms, right? And that creates problems, right? So, and again, I, I just, I wanna really reinforce this. It's not a technology issue. It's not that we have all of these cool tools that do whatever, that's not the point I'm making. Just like the printing press fundamentally changed our relationship to what we could do with information and knowledge. This fundamentally, it's the same kind of fundamental change. It happened when we started writing and reading uh, as a society, it happened with the printing press and it's happening again with the internet, right? So when we talk about the novel and we talk about science fiction novels, we would never have a science fiction novel without the printing press. Without that ability to mass produce texts on paper, we don't have it. But every time we talk about novels, we don't go, oh yeah, it's just the printing press. It's just that technology is assumed underneath the bottom. And it's the same with what I'm talking about here. Yes, obviously, the printing press makes it so that you read things in a straight line, you go from page to page. The technology affects the way that you read, for sure. But on the other side, the technology here affects all the connections. It affects people's ability to read your data and target you specifically, right? Those are all parts of it. But as it influences our teaching, it's not a technology question. It's a cultural question, right? Internet allows for abundant information and connection, right? It's those two pieces, the abundance of information, students can find whatever they want, abundance of connection. Students are gonna to work together whether you want them to or not, right? And those two pieces together change what it is we're doing. I see that question, Susie. I'm gonna leave it to the end because it is long and uh, I'll get distracted. Okay, so things we've learned. And this is what uh, this, with that as a background, with that abundance as a backdrop, trust is complex. We fundamentally don't trust our students. The vast majority of conversations I've had with faculty in the last seven or eight months, and I've talked to hundreds, is that how can I lock down my students so that I know that they're being tested? How do I make sure my students aren't cheating? We fundamentally don't trust them. And the question is, is why is that? How do we address that? Right? There's two, thing, two, two approaches that are being taken right now. One of them is to lock it down, right? We don't trust them. Let's lock down the systems. Let's make sure that every student has a suspicion level, right? This is from a piece of software called Proctorio. Um, their approach to invigilation, their proctoring software, is to assume that every student is suspicious, right? And they're a percentage of suspicion, right? So either you are a little bit suspicious or a lot suspicious, but fundamentally, I'm in a relationship where I don't trust you, my student, and I'm gonna spend all of my time with a video camera into your house. Um, in some cases, there are some pieces of software that have three video cameras, locking your browser, controlling your keyboard, invasive um, in, in the extreme, right? Right into people's houses. But at the same time, more concerning is that the suspicion that relationship with our students is an unhealthy one. Having a relationship in which you are constantly suspicious about the other person is not a healthy relationship. So I ask you the question, you've been sitting here um, and I'll get you to throw into the chat room for an answer here. How many of you have looked away from your screen in the last 20 minutes? Have you looked away from your screen? Have you checked your phone? Did you pet your dog? Did you talk to a child who walked into the room? Did you address your partner who wanted to know what you were doing today? So just in the chat room, tell me if any of you have totally focused on the camera. You looked away from the screen multiple times, you were multitasking. You have a phone and a child of source. Of course you did. Of course you did. 
Maybe you got up to check the mail, you checked your phone. Those are totally normal actions for people to do in their house. You had a coffee, Oscar, I hope you brought enough coffee for everybody. So um, you can't see all the responses because some people are responsibly just to all panelists and some people are doing all panelists and attendees, but I'm getting a whole bunch of them here. Um, that is a normal human response to being in your house and being in a test. It doesn't mean you're not focused. Yes, I am so happy that you got my point in half. That's exactly what I mean. This is an unhealthy relationship that we're creating with our students. And it's an unreasonable expectation that you sit in front of a, a, a computer in your own house and not look anywhere else, not look at your phone, not talk to a person. This idea of trying to enforce scarcity onto the world out into people's houses doesn't reflect the world we live in, doesn't prepare anybody for anything, and it's not healthy. And worse, it doesn't even work, right? If you talk to experts in the field, they will tell you that it doesn't actually check against the science of learning either. So if the problem is that you have to test a large number of students, then what you need to do is come up with a new way to test a large number of students. Because this process simply doesn't work. It's unhealthy and potentially unethical, right? Okay, so another thing we've learned. Learning is a complex beast, right? It is. And there are a lot of things that we do that are about being in physical spaces that maybe we never needed to do in the first place. So testing. Is it something, does it actually make sense? Does giving somebody a multiple choice test actually say that they learned anything? Do you remember your grade 12 chemistry tests? I will tell you a true fact. My 14 year old is doing their um, first science exam last week. And I said, hey, why don't you make a test for me about what you're learning? And that way, you know, creating a test is a good way of getting ready for your multiple choice test because this is great, their grade nine test. I got 29 out of 97 on that test. No, it was 25. 25 out of 97 was the score I got. 25 out of 97 on grade nine science. I really liked grade nine science. I did well in grade nine science. I got 25 out of 97 on the multiple choice test. I don't remember any of those things. Do I need to remember them? Is remembering actually the thing we want? Is that what we want to be testing? I leave you with that question. I don't think it's an answerable question, but I think it's one worth asking. If we have access through our phones to all the information of the world, is information the thing we want to be testing? A uh, colleague of mine, Clarissa Sorensen Unruh, asking the question, first year science labs, do they actually help? Does having 100 people in a science lab doing a rote science experiment where everybody is doing exactly the same thing one after another, is that actually useful? You know, I'm working with some engineers right now um, doing virtual labs and they're like, you know, this, this lab face to face has never really made any sense. We just have students watch the pipes and then write about them. These virtual labs actually work better for this thing. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't labs that you definitely need face to face for, but I do ask you, a modern lab, how much are people doing titration in modern labs nowadays? Is that actually a thing? Or do giant computers do those things now? I ask you, and certainly first year labs, do they still make sense? Sorry for the lack of a hyphen. I said something we still need to do. How about the one hour lecture, right? Lectures make total sense. And here I am giving you a lecture at the same time that I'm saying we don't need to do them. Three hour lectures, right? Those are about the fact that we got to get all of those people to come together into the space so that we can bring the person with the information into the space so they can all do it at the same time, right? used to cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to record people to do stuff, right? So I did this incredibly scientific quiz on a uh, question on Twitter. Maybe some of you actually answered this. I had 538 votes of the education people who follow me on Twitter asking when teaching synchronously, what is the maximum amount of time you should be talking without some kind of student interaction? Well, that certainly slides towards the small, right? That's not a lecture anymore, that's a workshop, right? So long lectures. Is that actually something we should have ever been doing? Textbooks. What is a textbook? It is the combination 
of industry knowledge put together by some of your colleagues into a step-by-step -step process. The original textbooks were created because the teachers didn't fully understand the content that they were teaching. In 2020, what possible reason could there be to charge a student $300 for a physics textbook when all the information in the physics textbooks already available on the internet and we all maybe have agreed that being able to search through the internet and find information is actually the skill that people need. And if you're teaching first year physics, shouldn't you know all the stuff in first year physics? Shouldn't you be able to find that information and put it together? It seems like a lot of money to be asking people to spend for something that really isn't designed for the world we're in today. All right, moving forward. People's lives are complex. This is something else we've learned. Like just in the way that you guys have described being inside of your house, um, you know, teacher workload, in the last nine months have been off the charts, right? I mean, the, the thing that I keep hearing from faculty uh, is what research, right? People are totally changing the way they're doing stuff. They're changing the approaches they're taking and that life has gotten a lot more complex. I've heard problems with student engagement. Uh, we've got problems with program coordination, uh, problems getting people to do group work, faculty overwork, all of this stuff, right? Tons and tons and tons of problems. But our students are also living complex lives. This is a legit picture, a legit picture from my colleague's classroom. Um, her student was doing a presentation that day and this is the picture from behind him. His landlord had decided that that was the day that they were going to replace the kitchen while he was presenting for his, and he didn't even know it was gonna happen. So he got a door, he got a ring on the doorbell the day he was doing his presentation. And his landlord had decided that was the day they were rebuilding the kitchen. People's lives are complex. There's a lot going on in people's houses. That should fundamentally affect the way that we teach, right? So I, I've got, this is an argumentative point and we're going a little longer, but uh, the uh, organizers made the mistake of telling me I could talk more at the start of this. So I'm gonna push in probably for another 10 or 12 minutes and then we'll go to Q and A. So this is a bit of more of an argument, uh, an argumentative claim. If you've agreed with the stuff before, it's likely you will not agree with this, but I would like you to at least think about it. When we look at designing our courses, the one constant is the amount of time that the students are gonna spend. Okay, not learning objectives, not whatever, not the classroom, not how much we teach, not the credit hours, because credit hours are the hours we spend in a physical classroom. Doesn't need to be that anymore, right? We don't need to have three physical hours a week in a university course or whatever. As we sort of stretch out time this way, we use the internet, that relationship can change. So it's not 36 hours a term anymore. What about total work hours? So if you look at that, the average amount of time, according to the Carnegie unit for universities, for every hour you spend in classroom, the expectation is gonna do two to three hours of work outside the classroom. Different people have different measurements about this. Uh, you probably have your own feelings about this. But at the end of the day, the end of the day, the amount of work a student can do is finite and by agree by large agreement of how higher education works, somewhere between 80 and 120 hours of work in one course for a student. That's what that looks like. So what I'm suggesting is, is once we take away the physical time that you're gonna spend, the question becomes, how do you break down the amount of work you actually want a student to do? Not what the, because you can have learning objectives and decide what you need somebody to learn at the beginning, but how do you know you have enough time to get that done? Starting with learning objectives has never made sense to me, right? I understand that people love their learning objectives, but if I say um, that those learning objectives have to be curtailed by the physical amount of time that a student has to actually work in your course. And what we found as people who have moved digital is that the workload on students has skyrocketed and gone way past that point, partially because some faculty don't understand how much time it takes for a student to do a certain kind of work. So I know how long maybe it takes for somebody to write an essay, but I've seen uh, faculty who um, 
guesstimate a discussion forum post to 15 minutes. That's two hour process. In that conversation, how much actual work are you expecting from your students? One should be negotiated with your students. You should explain to them what your expectation is. And two, it has to be something that absolutely starts your development process. So lastly, and my last point here, uh, and this is something I try to say in every talk, every single professional who I respect and admire in this conversation at some point says, what we've learned more than anything else is how important it is for us to build care into what we do. And a special shout out here to Maha Bali um, for her own thoughts on this. Um, so I wanna finish this up by talking a little bit about pedagogies of care and how we build that into our process. So the absolute most important starting point is that we need to have that self-awareness. We need to look at our own biases. We need to look at our own, the, the first thing I always end up deconstructing with faculty is I teach the way I was taught, right? I had a faculty member say to me the other day, well, um, overworking students is something that was done to me. It's something I'm gonna to do to my students. Why would you do that? Why are you giving your students busy work that doesn't help them learn because you want them to do more work? Doesn't make sense. So show care in your design, keep things simple, keep them equitable, keep them engaging. My favorite pattern that I'm seeing emerging inside of COVID is faculty going, I'm just covering this content. Why am I covering all this content? This is the most important thing. This is the thing I need to make sure they learn. Find those things that are the most important thing. Weight your work towards those things, right? Get rid of the chaff, the fillers inside of your, of your, of your courses. Embrace the complexity that comes with the internet because it's gonna be there anyway, right? You're not gonna get away from that complexity, so embrace it. This is, this is a tough one. Uh, shared space, uh, the shared space for students to come together and work, whether it's during your office hours, whether it's a space that you've set up inside of something like Microsoft Teams or Slack, trying to create that space for students to work together informally is really important. It's also super, super hard. I would say that there aren't really good patterns for how to do this yet. And it's certainly something that I'm seeing developing through this whole piece where I'll talk to some people and say, yeah, I set it up, but no students came. I set it up, but no students came. A conversation to look for going forward. Show care in your habits. Um, presence is the thing that makes the difference for the engagements your students have with you. If you send them an article, send them a little note that says, hey, the first time I read this article, it was super dense. Uh, give it some time, read it over twice, and it should start to come to you. I, an introductory video at the start of your course is great, but that's not enough to really get to know your students. You need to take that interstitial space, that space that happens at the start of a class, the first five minutes, the last two minutes of hanging out at the end of class, and you need to find places for that to happen online, assuming you're teaching online. Now, some of you are and some of you aren't. But when teaching online, finding that interstitial space, that human space, and building it into your internet uh, stuff is absolutely key. Show care in your connections. So you need to imagine that you're serving every student. And we don't have time to get into universal design for learning in this talk, but I mean, that's a really great way of looking at it, right? Your students are all different. Your students are all coming at this from different perspectives. And you need to reach out to those students as if they all matter, right? not just one kind of student, not just the students who are like you, uh, though I understand the temptation. And lastly, and my last note here before we move to Q&A, is show care to yourself, right? At the end of the day, no matter how many, no matter how long the pandemic lasts, no matter what situation you're in, everybody's lives are upset. Our students' lives have been changed. Your lives have been changed. If you don't show care to yourself, you're not going to be able to show care to others. Can't pour from an empty cup. Take care of each other one way or the other, okay?